Uh, welcome to our webinar, um, Understanding Tifariki, the Early Childhood Curriculum. Um, my name is Monica. I'm one of the learning specialists for Te Poti Akimanatanga, and we're really excited to bring you this very special um, session today, presented by Anne Heatherly and Tara Fagan. Now, before we get started, um, we will begin with Karakia. Um, so, Tara, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Thank you. He karakia tinatanga. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki mā tāra tāra ki tai. Ehi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he hoka, he hauhu, te hei Māori ora. Thank you. Great. Um, now, we are really delighted today to welcome Anne Heatherly and Tara Fagan as they discuss our early childhood curriculum, Te Whariki. Um, Anne Heatherly is a kindergarten teacher by a teaching qualification, and she says she's old enough to have been part of the implementation of Te Whariki since, in in since its inception in the early 1990s. Until recently, Anne worked for Core Education as the lead content writer for Te Whariki Online, a resource for early years teachers funded by the Ministry of Education. Now, you already know Tara, who is um, the chair of Te Poti Akimanatanga, the Association of Educators Beyond the Classroom, and she's also the principal advisor learning at Te Papa Tonga Reba. <laughs> um, with a master in education and a bachelor in education specializing in early childhood education, Tara and Anne share a common love for early learning and they've worked together during their time at CORE. Now uh, for this webinar, just um, to let you know as usual, please use the chat for any questions and comments. We will monitor that and we will pass those questions on to Ta Anne and Tara um, during or at the end of the webinar. Um, please also note, um, we are recording this webinar. The recording has already started. And um, after the participants' faces have been blurred out, we will upload this to our YouTube channel so you can always come back and watch this webinar again later. Well, that's all for me for now. So I hand it over to Anne and Tara. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kick this off, um, but I first of all want to say um, in this time of masks, I feel very grateful to you all for allowing me to wear lipstick for a change. Um, I, I realise it's the first time in months I've put on lipstick. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview, uh, a few minutes about Tafariki. Now, I realise that there'll be a mixture of people here. Some of you may even be early childhood. Um, kaiako, um, and some of you may well be familiar, but for those who aren't, I'll just try and make it really brief, and then Tara and I were going to to um, start with a <laughs> with a bit of a conversation. So, um, Te Whare Ki came into being first of all in the early 90s. It was um, the the final version was published in 1996. It was then updated in 2017. In the 1990s, it was um, considered to be world leading. And one of the reasons for this was the way it was, um, was um, developed. Um, it was a, part, a true partnership between Tamati and Tilly Reedy and Helen May and Margaret Carr. And so instead of writing it, Helen and Margaret, who were the early childhood experts in a sort of Eurocentric view, instead of them writing it and then giving it to Māori to, um, to, to critique, they um, each group went away and said, what is your vision for early childhood? And that was quite um, world-breaking at the time. Um, it provides, another thing to know I think about Tafariki is that it is required guidance for all early childhood services. So there's a whole range. From, um, there's home-based, um, play centre, kindergarten, child, uh, early childhood, child care, as it's known, Montessori, everything. Any service that gets money from the government is required to implement um, elements of Te Whariki. Um, I think as far as um, you're concerned, it's a, it's a, it's a document well, it's for everyone. It's a document to dip in and out of. It's not a document to start in the beginning and read to the end. It, 
I see it as a kind of reference point for um, in planning and or in reflection on what we're doing. So I, I would suggest that's for you people as well. Um, next slide. Oh, no, no, that slide, sorry. That, no, sorry, go back. <laughs> I realise now which slide you're on. Uh, it's, it, oh, no, you can take it to the next slide. Sorry, I am. <laughs> um, so part of um, the foundation of it is, um, is um, te tiriti. And um, that's very much at the fore of the new, of the 2017 update. The idea that children learn best and most when the experiences are aligned to their cultural values, their ways of being and doing, and artifacts in their lives. And as I thought about this, I thought, I think all of you are well placed to do this because you probably are working in this in this space already, strong bicultural um, awareness and knowledge. And so um, probably even, you know, like overall, um, that's not necessarily the case with, with all of our kaiako and centres. So you're in a kind of really, I think in a really good position if, if my assumption is correct, and I'm sure it is. Next slide, please. Um, I uh, there's, just to give you a brief idea of the overall framework. Um, there are four principles um, which guide uh, which guide decision making in every aspect of practice, and these are Fakamana empowerment, Kotahi Tanga holistic learning, um, Fano Tangata family and community and na hono na, na our relationships. Um, so they're the foundation that guides um, everything that we do in terms of curriculum and program. There are also five strands, and this is where the fariki works. It's the weaving of the strands and the, and the principles. And the strands really uh, give us the guidance in very broad terms about content. Um, and so you've got mana atua, well-being, mana whenua, belonging, mana tangata, contribution, mana reo, um, communication, and mana o tu, uh, o tu, tu um, exploration. Um, and in that diagram, you'll notice that there are some threads that don't have any um, names or anything to them. And that's the whole, the whole idea of that, the image, is the idea that they represent potential and also, I guess, some localised things that may not that may be an addition to, to those principles and strands. So the potential of development, it's not a complete finished, um, the, the idea that it's not a complete and finished and sewn up curriculum. There's, there's room, there's openness to, to um, make it localised and we'll talk about that later. There are, uh, next slide, please. Um, so under the strands sit um, learning outcomes, and this is one of the big changes that happened with the 2017 update, that the number of um, learning outcomes was reduced from 100, and, I think it was 118 to 20. Um, and the learning outcomes are very broad, and they have potential for interpretation. Um, and that's good. It's also risky in the sense that um, um, without, um, they can be interpreted um, in a way that probably doesn't promote learning. Um, so, and I think Elisa, for those of you who are on with Lisa Terini the other day, she had some concerns about the learning outcomes. And I think that's, I do understand that, although I think that they generally should be broad enough for people. Um, there's a good summary on page 24 and 25, and if you want to dive deeper into, into the learning outcomes, you'll see that, um, that the, the following pages. Um, again, use it as a reference, use the learning outcomes as a reference, um, rather, yeah, and, and thinking about it in your own context, I think, is a really good thing. 
Um, the new version, just moving along, the new, new, the, um, the, the 2017 version um, really looked at the links between the New Zealand um, curriculum and um, Marotanga or Aotearoa. So there's quite a, there was a new piece put into the curriculum showing how the two could be woven together. And um, uh, just thinking what else? Oh, yes. Um, I think that's probably in that slide all. And just moving forward another slide. Um, Te Whāreki Online, which is what I was really involved in and, and still am to a degree, um, but not as a lead content person, um, is the resource that the Ministry have developed to support it. And on there, I think it can be accessed by, accessed by anyone. I would suggest if you don't already subscribe to the newsletter, it only comes out once a term, so you won't be bombarded with emails. And um, it gives you the latest updates. And there's some amazing, I think for particularly some amazing videos there that you know um, are worth dipping into. So in summary, um, I just wanted to say, here, yes, here's my elevator pitch for um, Te Whareke. Um, it's not very prescriptive, and as I said, that's both great because it means that it can be responsive locally, but also it's risky. It foregrounds play and playfulness, and I think that's a key thing to think about. Um, the intention of it is to be mana enhancing, so giving children whatever age, and by the way, it does cover birth to five, it, or yes, birth to five, six if you if you take the fact that children don't have to start till six in school. Um, so the idea is of giving children, it, it, you know, whatever you, whatever's done should um, give children agency um, and in their learning um, and confidence. And finally, I think it values highly the interactions. And this is another key thing about the 2017 is that it is, um, it puts the, the, the um, interactions to the fore. So the interactions between people, places, and things. So you have all of those things in your context to think about. Um, my final um, slide for this bit before we get into the discussion is, um, is I wanted to just, um, this is taken from a, um, a marae um, down in Bluff. Um, where they take the children, so it's an art, so it's taking children into another context, which is um, you know like what you're thinking about, um, and it's it's on Tafariki online, by the way, and I think Monica's going to put the link into the notes. Um, so for me, this just this image just um, captures Tafariki in action. Um, so you've got a, a child there who is looking so engaged and intent. Um, you've got, uh, you can see that, that the hand to me is um, so respectful of what she's about to touch. Um, she's been given exposure to things that are local and important. Um, and she's been given time to explore. And so I think I, you, yeah, I, I mean, that's my interpretation. If I had time, I would love to hear other interpretations as well, but maybe some people can put in the chat. But to me, that's the essence of Te Whāriki. So that's the end of my slide stuff. <laughs> and, um, so we'll open up and have a conversation. Um, before we start, I really want to acknowledge Anne for coming along and giving her time with us today to talk to us about early childhood curriculum. Um, sometimes in your life you cross people's paths who teach you a lot about learning in your career. And for me, Anne is one of those people. She's got a long history in early childhood education, but actually her ability to uh, think about the needs of projects and research and just the needs, how to make the best of every opportunity um, is something that I really admire about Anne. And she's taught me a lot over the years, I first got to know her through working with her at Core Education, and then um, we've we've remained in contact. So, um, and I always know Anne's one of those people I can go to for advice when I need it. So, I want to particularly acknowledge the work that you've done for the sector, Anne.
but also your time and, and sharing your knowledge with us today. Thanks. Um, so as we get started, um, Te Whareke's had a long history. I've been going back and touching with my early childhood roots lately and re-looking in about how it came to be and about the reforms of the 1980s, the PICO and the Meads reports that were in the early 90s that talked about the quality of education, um, the quality of education for Māori and particularly the quality of education for early childhood education that wasn't serving um, early childhood or other people very well. And so from that came the initial view that uh, Te Whareke, um, there needed to be an early childhood curriculum to support Te Whareke, uh, for, to support our young children's development. And when you were doing your introduction, you talked a little bit about the need for the two documents, but can you talk just a little bit more about the how they came to being? Originally in the initial Te Whareke document, we had the Kohangareo version and um, the English version sort of all meshed in, but they're two very separate documents now. And can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, I think this was one of the main reasons for the update in 2017, is that the context um, in, in Aotearoa New Zealand has changed. So it, in the first document, you've got um, part A being the English version and part B being the Māori version, which, which now seems sort of incredibly... Mm. Um, anachronistic or, or kind of, um, yeah, just doesn't seem, doesn't sit comfortably with us. And that's, um, that's just one example. The other thing is, uh, the other thing I want to say here is with um, that Kohanga Reo have, um, have actually um, a, a slight, a, a different kopapa. Their, their kopapa is based on Te Ao Māori, um, whereas um, the English early childhood curriculum is based more on what I would call now Eurocentric or Western um, philosophy. And so it was important in terms of tetiriti partnership that both were um, acknowledged and, and represented. Mm -hmm. And so they're not direct translations. So uh, it's, um, and that's an, I guess an important point to make. Um, and the kohanga um, side, which is faces that one, you know, it's upside down. Well, oh, no, it's not upside down. The English version is upside down. But whichever way you go, it sort of you can flip it over. Um, is uh, is written by and for those um, those working in kohanga. Mm -hmm. The um, the English version is written um, and or, or or revised by and for. Um, those working in um, English medium um, and also some that work in bilingual, multilingual um, services obviously as well. Does that answer it enough? Yeah, I think I think that's really clear and it gives a good description of how it's come about and I read a really interesting piece by um, Sarah Tioni the other day where she was talking about how Te Whareke came to be in the history. We might actually share the link with the notes following this webinar because I don't have them to hand at the moment, Monica, although they might be in one of those script documents I've been working on. But um, I want to say 2.8, but I'm not sure. Anyhow, um, really interesting piece about the history. So you filled in that really nicely about um, the, t the, the perspectives and the balancing and the um, intent yeah that sits behind the document for our young people, our youngest learners. And, and can I just say, add something there, T Tara? Mm -hmm. I think in, when Te Whareke first came out, as I said before, we thought we'd done really well in terms of you know, having um, a partnership mm -hmm. in terms of its development. But if you go back and look at all the research and the, and the, and the, um, the stuff, the, the papers written, a lot of them, are very critical of the fact that what it led to, in principle, it was an ideal. In principle, it was, it it was great, but in practice, it um, it was a tokenistic um, document mm. um, or a tokenistic interpretation. That's what evolved, mm. and so I think in two thousand seventeen, it's kind of been a bit of a um, an attempt to address that. I think, and but because it's a um, a non-prescriptive document, it's still oh. that is still one of the challenges mm -hmm. we face in early childhood. Which is why I think, well, my assumption mm -hmm. that you people are very 
much of you in you know um involved in this is um in, in bicultural practices and awareness is mm. got an advantage yeah thank you Anne. I'm going to go on and talk about assessment for learning and dispositions for learning now. That features heavily both in um, both in both versions of Tafariki, certainly the current one anyway. What are dispositions for learning? Can you tell us a little bit more about how they are? And so we've got an understanding and then maybe we can explore how they might work in a cultural and heritage setting. They may may or may not, but yeah, tell us a little bit about them. So I guess dispositions, we all have dispositions towards um, um, whatever we're um, doing. Um, they're kind of like attitudes or approaches we take um, to, to situations. Um, uh, they've been described also as habits of mind. Um, and I think one of the ways to understand, I always remember Lillian Katz saying, you know, it's all very well um, to have children who can read, so they've got the skill of reading, mm -hmm. but what we really want is children who love to read. So that the difference is it's reading plus the disposition of motivation or curiosity or, or whatever that makes a child, that, you know, that means a child uses the, the skills to their advantage. And when what what the the belief or the, the we know now that children learn these dispositions very early on, um, and when they do have those dis, the positive ones, and there are some negatives as well, but if they do have those ones that afford learning, then that sets them up well for for life, mm -hmm. for school, and for life for their future. And so, in early childhood, we've um, in New Zealand and in, with around this curriculum, the sorts of dispositions that we have valued are courage, curiosity, um, perseverance, trust, playfulness, um, confidence, and um, a, ability for um, to take responsibility to others. And those have been aligned, those sorts of dispositions have been aligned with the strands of Tafariki. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's, does mm. that, that? Yeah, well, it I'm does. Yeah, and because uh, I'm thinking from a cultural and heritage perspective of uh, being an educator, oh, yeah. well, you know, we only have such a short time with our students, probably an hour at the most, judging by the age of this group. And so we don't have the opportunity to get to know the children as in depth as their kayako would do in the early childhood centre. But I was thinking, I was doing a reading the other day, um, it was produced, and I can't tell you the authors off the top of my head, um, produced in Australia last year, but they were talking about cultural and heritage sectors, working with some of those dispositions, and really about that noticing, recognising and responding. Yeah. As you're doing programmes for students, what is it that you notice that they're all drawn to? Or what is it they're all interested in? And that might just take your focus and, and help support some of those dispositions that the, the Kayako and the student are working with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. So yes, yeah. so so if you're thinking wider than just we want the children, we want children who come in to learn about butterflies, or we want children to learn about, um, yeah. you know, certain animals or whatever, yeah. or yeah, yeah. or artifacts. Um, yeah. We want. It's. I mean, getting back to that photo of that little child, that baby. Yeah touching that thing, the disposition, yeah. Yeah. the curiosity you could, yeah. I'm sure I'm not alone, you could see it. You could, you could see it and the rich language you could use to describe that, you know, mm -hmm. you've got the texture of the woven flax sitting around, you've got the smooth surface of that painamu, you know, yeah, so yeah. much richness that can come into that one experience that can really enhance. And actually, if you look at the video, you see that the child does touch the, the mm -hmm. flax and the smoothness yeah. and so yeah. that learning. and. I had a quote from somebody here before. Um, this is a woman. I'll just, just can I share this? This is just yes, very oh, yes. quickly. Um, it's actually from the New Yorker, and it's a, an article about a woman who um, who actually um, changed the face of picture books in the in the early twenties. But one of the things she said was, "It is only the blind eye of the adult that finds the familiar uninteresting." Mm. And I thought this is actually the role of the educator in Tafariki is to be the person who finds 
the um, familiar strange who mm. can who can appreciate and be present with that mm. child to to enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's amazing. It's amazing to think about. Yeah. Um, as you've described to Fariki, local curriculum is something that comes through very strongly. Um, and of course, in the school curriculum, local curriculum has been built into the New Zealand curriculum, but schools are sometimes still grappling with what that means, but it's so well embedded into Fariki. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, um, about that focus on local curriculum and the relevance of it to young learners? Yeah, the relevance to, of it to young learners, and, and actually, actually to any learner, because I think I'm like this too. Mm. I learn best when I build on knowledge I know, or I'm, um, or their experiences. That there's some kind of element of experiences that are familiar within it. Yeah. Mm. So it's a, definitely true of young, of very young children, um, that they that what. Yeah, so building on that knowledge. Now, some of that knowledge will come from home, some of it will come from the community. And so um, for an early childhood um, kayako, that's an important role is finding that out. We can talk about how what, there are ways to, obviously, if you're only seeing ch your people, for your children for an hour or so, that's a bit more challenging, but there are things you can do. Mm. Um, so it's that business of working from the concrete and the familiar, mm. concrete and the familiar, I think. Um, the other thing I think in terms of local curriculum, um, oh, so that means that we're interested, for example, in local history, in local animals, um, in, um, in, in what people do locally. Like there's a, a, a um, an example, a story of practice on Tafariki online um, that's based in Pai and near Pai here, and it's all about it's to do with voyaging, and it, it's a they recognise that a lot of the, the the families there enjoy boating of some sort or fishing or something, and so they they have made an effort, uh, you know, a particular effort in their planning to to bring that in. But I think the other aspect of local curriculum is actually um the children's interests and okay it's experience but it's also their interests and in building on that so it's not just i think the two are different so um and and, and being a flexible enough to incorporate that and and the um aspirations of the community of the local community yeah mm. And there's a really good, oh, just going to say, a really good example on Tafariki Online from Littleton, and I know that Monica's going to put that somewhere, um, where I where they've explored over time local um, Māori history in relation to the local mountain. Mm. You know, it so, makes so much sense that you start with learning about what is around you and what you see every day. And even for our non-verbal children, they see so much, you know, that ability to be able to see and make connections to their community and hear the language of their community, um, mm. really empowering. Um, and I think schools, even though they're doing well with understanding local curriculum, can really look to early childhood to understand a little bit more about how that can be put into practice. Yep. So when it comes to assessing children's learning and working out their next steps for development, what does that look like? Um, how, how is young children's learning assessed in early childhood? Well, I think because we put a lot of um, value on learning dispositions as well as content, mm -hmm. then the disposition, then, then, uh, then assessing the dispositions mm -hmm. becomes important. And um, so, you know, how engaged are they? How involved? Um, how can, how, um, uh, how, if the child is, is struggling with some perseverance you know how what can i do i can i can look at that i can see it what can i do to help that child um perhaps gain a bit of um a bit more perseverance in their in their life but it's also about recognizing and this is this is about the mana enhancing aspect of it it's recognizing what children can do mm -hmm. and again i take you back to the baby mm -hmm. you know like what can that baby do yeah yeah um that baby is a researcher of it, it of life really already 
and I think that's um, so. So, so in early childhood, we value skills and knowledge, yes, but always in conjunction and in, in the assessment with with dispositions, with learning dispositions. Mm -hmm. um, I think. What else did I have here? Um, I think one of the things that is challenging is that in terms of assessment is that at this age the age that we're talking about learning is often very messy and up and down and roundabout and so you know one day um, they might be interested in in one or, or challenging themselves in one area and um, can be you know in another area another day so we don't we tend not to put too much emphasis well, no, as I say this, I have to correct myself. Progress is, we want to see progress, of course, but we have to be very careful that we don't turn that into a kind of checklist because it, and, and silo, and silo pieces of knowledge. So um, in the way that sometimes assessment, and, you know, I think it's changing, is happens in school, you know, where you've got that sort of silo look we're looking looking broadly it's quite a complex and, and difficult area i think mm -hmm. um but um i think the other thing about early child assessment we're interested in particularly no with all children with all even babies how they assess themselves that's the mm -hmm. other thing that's important so um mm -hmm. you know if you're working with four-year-olds um you know questions like so how much you've done that differently or um or what um what was really challenging for you what was difficult when you you know did this or whatever mm -hmm. so we try and um we want to really get to yes and to and and so in terms of the documentation just briefly some of you will probably be familiar with you if you've got your own children with learning stories mm -hmm. we tend to focus on a narrative approach to documentation rather than a checklist type thing because mm. that's how you capture the richness that um can't, you know we need when we're combining mm. dispositions and skills and knowledge and um, mm. children's voice and yeah 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 i remember many years ago um and it might have been when i was doing my early childhood training i can't actually remember when it happened but we were we were watching a child in action at the sandpit and we were asked to do sort of like a running record or, and a record or, and then write up the narrative assessment of it. So I did mine and, and a colleague I was with did theirs. And I, I um, have a strong focus on social, social competence and, and relationships. And so my story was very much around who the child interacted with, what was happening in their space, um, all those sorts of things. Whereas my colleague came with a very science lens and yeah. so hers was all about the scientific concepts that was happening with the child built pouring sand and all the rest. So, you know, you almost need that rich perspective right across because so much can happen when you're observing and assessing around, um, you know, a particular learning area. It's, uh, for me, that was a really good reminder to look at it with all lenses, not just the one that I tend to focus in on. Yeah, and, and I'll just tell a story too that always makes me think about assessment and children's competencies. So it was actually a, a situation I came across in Australia in the outback and um, a child who was um, only two and a half um, and lived in a very isolated, they had to pass through 62 gates to get to, from the house to the main road, 62 farm gates. And I always remember this teacher saying that that child was what they didn't know but they knew the different combinations of the way they could get themselves through those 62 wow. gates at at two and a half and this is the amazing thing about learning and how much learning depends on your experience and background and yeah it was just a, it's just a reminder you know to not take things for granted and also you know what are our expectations you know my expectations may not have been that of opening gates <laughs> but yeah. but if i know that kind of thing i'm likely to view that child as competent which is yeah. which i missed out in the beginning but yeah. the tafari key aspiration statement about competence being competent mm -hmm. and confident 
Yeah. So yeah. finding where they are competent and confident is part yeah. of the assessment. Yep. Yeah. And that strengths based approach to looking at what a child, which is exactly what you're saying, look at what a child can do rather than what they can't do. I remember when we developed um, a, a, a online platform called ECE Online, it was sort of its first network of its kind. Um, and one of the things we did with that was developed a set of strength based cards based around the outcomes of Tafariki, but it was strength based so that when centres were working with students, Sometimes some of those where they were determining whether there were any educational special needs or things like that. And that, you know, the focus sometimes tends to be on what a child can't do rather than what they can do. And so we put all these competencies on a cards, set of cards. And the idea was that teachers would look and say, yes, we know they're capable of this. Yes, we know they're capable of that. And then you'd be left with some that they hadn't do. So that would be the, the yeah. tool that would help you guide to what's the next step in learning for this child. And it really switched things around, um, that, that looking at what a child can do and their competence and that mana enhancing that you talk about. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think the other thing, there's another um, just important thing in, in Tafariki um, where they talk about um, uh, e tono wa, e tono wa, um, in their own time. Mm. And so um, giving children time, and I mentioned this for those of you who were in Lisa's thing, I, mm. you know, I, I, you did that whole idea that we, that children need time. And if you're if they're coming to a new place, their exploration may be quite different mm. from your expectations. Yeah, mm. what they're interested in. And if we can let it go with that, that's great, you know. Mm. Yeah. One of the things that struck me through my early childhood training, which um, while I don't work in early childhood to the same degree, but I really value the training that I had, is the way in which um, applicate or, or you don't teach in subjects, you teach across the curriculum, you teach across children's focus areas, you teach across, so you very rarely do you have a, a reading, a writing, a structure to your day. Uh, to be fair, there are some centres that do have that focus, but on the whole, it's that working across. And for me, that's something I valued about, um, yeah, as I said, about my early childhood learning. And can you tell us a little bit about that integrated curriculum and that ho holistic approach to teaching and learning? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I'd say about that is that, um, well, actually, what you've summed it up really well, I think, um, but is not siloing, um, mm. trying not to silo things. Um, so thinking, you know, if we are doing, if we are involved in, in, in some kind of aspect of science, then what can we bring in that might um, help, um, enable children to um, develop learning around art in the same at the same time what can we do to so thinking that sort of broad thinking about all the curriculum and again i go back to the littleton kindergarten video because in that it's about history but it's about digital technology competency it's about drama it's about storytelling it's about art it's, it's just about all in there yeah mm. um but for, children, for very young children, they may not come to that. We, that's where our role um, as adults um, with our extended knowledge can really help to facilitate that, is to, is to think about if you're planning something, what ways can we broaden this out and make it more holistic? And again, it's that building on children's interests as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, uh, if... That can often be a way into things like mathematics, like you know, if, if children are very physically um, um, competent, um, then there are all sorts of ways of introducing mathematics, which is then purposeful for them rather than just an exercise. And I think that's an important part mm -hmm. about a curriculum too, that it's it's purposeful. It's not just for the sake of doing it. Even very young children get can understand, you know, if they're just being made to do something because it's they're made to do something. It's mm. much better if we can think of purpose sitting behind it. That's a bit off the off the topic, yeah. sorry, but um, yeah, yeah, but still valuable in itself. So when we think about cultural and heritage sector um, and practice, um, which is which which is what we're from, what are some tips for working with an early childhood audience that that you 
you've learned about over your career and that you think um, would help us as we think about working with teachers and their students? Right. Okay. Um, I made a bit of a list. <laughs> um, the first one I think many of you probably already are doing um, is the building of relationships with people, reaching out to your early childhood services um, um, in whatever way you can. Um, and I think being able to just even, as part of that building relationships, even indicating you have a little knowledge about Tafari Key would be greatly helpful. Yeah, to to that is um, so that you know that they'll be impressed. <laughs> that teachers will be impressed. Um, I think the other thing would be keeping um, and and perhaps working trying yeah once yeah building relationships but also working in collaboration so um keeping a fairly open mind to begin with and um about the development and how this might look um, um and i don't know inviting inviting them to 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 some kind of um hui where they where those ideas are explored that they have an idea they have a chance to perhaps see your context and then first, if they may not, as I said last time, the, the many teachers may not be from, may not have visited your context. They may not never have been to a museum or an art gallery or, or even a zoo or you know whatever it is. Um, so just bringing them into, giving them an opportunity, and then perhaps followed by a discussion, I think would be really good about how how a, a program might be developed. Um, keeping expectations, yeah. Um, realistic, as I said, a tono or a tonawa. Um, children, um, they may not be interested in the way, as I said, you intend it. And don't feel that's a failure. I think uh, there was a person on last with Lisa who was working at the Auckland Museum and it was a guy and he talked about the light thing that comes down from the dome. Now I've sat in the cafe having my latte and watched babies just absolutely transfixed by that mm -hmm. and you know what a gem of a thing that has turned out to be for them I think so yeah. you know those little hidden gems of um yeah so not seeing um if it didn't kind of go the way you said what not seeing the failure trying to um what did the children really enjoy finding ways in which to to um and see that as a jumping off point for integrating the things you want them to know with, um, you know, with their, ex with, with their, your expectations, with their interests, really, meeting in the middle. Um, I also said several, if you can, I know it's not always easy, several rather than one off, so that children do become mm -hmm. familiar with the place often first and then the, then the people and then the things later. So they have an opportunity to really build. I think I gave the example last time of, you know, learning to sew, you know, you don't just sit up, you don't make a wedding dress the first time you've made a, you pick up a sewing machine. It's the same with anything with um, children as well. So um, that was my list of, can you add something Tara? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I'm just reflecting on your example about um, Auckland Museum that I think it was Tom that shared yes. um, from Auckland Museum and Lisa's session. And at the Papa, when we did the Kōrongo Whakata, um exhibition, one of the, it was sort of, a, a, it was a an addition that came later, was just simply a projector on the ceiling, sending down some images on the ground. So they were almost like little, it's very simply done cartoons that sort of came and went. They were just in the sort of the, the light colour and they'd come. And the response from young children to that particular thing was quite incredible. Children would lie down and try and feel the pattern and move and interact with the way that the pattern was going. And it, every time I walked through that space, that would there would always be somebody there. Most often young children, but sometimes, you know, children of 10 and 12 that wanted to explore that part of the exhibition in their own way. And I think we can't underestimate the opportunities in that that we share. The other thing as you were talking, Anna, it reminded me of um, some work or, or some 
stories that you shared with me, and I want to say it was St. Matthew's Kindergarten in Auckland, I can't remember, but they had an artist that would come in and work with the children oh, yeah. on a regular basis. And the children's artwork was so stunning because they um, had the specialists that would talk about the, the brushes and the tools and the language. And when you saw children's art at maybe three and four compared to standard art, what these children were able to do because they had that specialist knowledge. Right. Yeah. So that was um, St. Andrews and all the And what the teachers did, and this is why this is actually a nice link into what I just said, was that they spent a day um, learning, immersing themselves with artists. It was a Saturday, actually. Mm. They went to the artists. And in the same way that I think if people came to, could, could be invited to, to see mm. to your place and what, you know, what's there and you could then discuss and from that they got some foundations that then the teachers were able to do and it's a really good example of what we now call in this very prominent in Tawariki, intentional teaching mm -hmm. so they went back and they didn't it wasn't highly structured but there was some structure because they taught children how to layer mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. They taught children how uh, a canvas. They taught children about um, over time um, about ways um, in which to to wipe their brushes and things like that. And when you saw the artwork, it was never the same. It was all different, but the competency was immense. So it, that's a really good example of um, meeting of children's um, um, creativity with you know and, and intentional teaching yeah mm -hmm. great example and i remember recently i was up at auckland uh art gallery in fact it must have been a, over a year ago toy two toy order was on and there was a kindergarten visiting and i can't remember its name the students all had ipads there and i talked to the teachers the students were using the ipads um to capture photos in that instance of the exhibition and i remember them um, being in the topo section and the children just mesmerized by the way it was looking and they're, they're taking their photos and i talked to the teachers what it was an unguided it was self-guided tour so they didn't have an educator support but they were a kindergarten that was close by and regularly visited so they had engaged previously with their educators but the the, the art gallery was a known place to these students it was something that the kindergarten had made um in a regular relationship with and I said, what are you going to do with these when they go back? And it was part of their ongoing program about looking at exploring the world, about looking at light and shadows. And so the iPads were just at that time a tool for the students to take the bits that were in, they were interested in and then be able to take it back to their kindergarten to further explore when they couldn't have access to the art gallery. So, you know, there's lots of ways in which our young, young people can engage with their creative side. Um, and I think that the fact that they've got opportunity to explore our spaces mm -hmm. um, is something pretty special. And with educators that are willing to just take, um, to support them in the way that they need, rather than just deliver the one-off programs, it will become much more rich for both the, the culture and heritage sector, but also for the students that visit. Mm -hmm. So that probably brings us to the end of our discussion, unless you've got anything to add, Anne. I thought we'd no, go on like to the question now. <laughs> Yeah. Any questions? Any thoughts? Tell us about what you're doing. Now, Monica, I can just see your question pop up. I'm just going to open it up. I haven't got my chat open. Um, so in our view, Anne, what are some of the key elements our educators need to create successful learning experience for young learners in our settings. Um, that sense of of uh, making the familiar strange, I think. Mm. Um, yeah. um, being flexible and open enough to um as i said not to feel failure when things don't go quite the way mm. um working that that um a, 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 the disposition of wanting to work collaboratively mm. yeah some things that come to the top of my mind mm. um yeah 
um, the, also the disposition to, I guess, um, you may need to persevere. You know, early childhood teachers, like everyone else, is busy. <laughs> um, and, you know, okay, don't be despondent if you only get a response from, you've emailed this out to 35 people and one comes back. Start with them. <laughs> yeah, and I'm too reminded um, about the fact about having a range of objects. Um, and I'm thinking Martin Langdon, who used to be our early childhood educator at the Papa, often talked about um, Matariki is one of our most popular programs, particularly for early childhood services um, that come into our space. And we're really busy um, from about the end of term one through to about the beginning of term three with that. And he would talk about, he would take them to different spaces, being very wary about um, the time that he would have with them, young people, their ability to walk, what their routines are. So thinking about where morning tea is, things like that, when do the students need to eat? And he would design this program in his last one. We've got a blog post that we will share in the um, the, the the with the re webinar recording. Um, he talked about the need to um, focus it on three key themes, but along with just talking to the students. So he would take them to an exhibition. He would have handling sort of collections. So if he was talking about the weaving of the the kitty that would hold the food for Matariki uh, as they went to collect it, he would have some of that raw flax for them to touch, but also the woven flax. So you know, thinking about what other experiences you can bring in, because we know some of our students, well, all of our students love that experiential learning. So how can we bring some of that into our spaces? as we work as well with our young people. Thank you. Helen's just put the link in there. So planning an ECE program for Matariki. I mean, it's just one way of um, doing that. And I can see Helen's put a comment in uh, the yes, chat. I've read, I've read that question and yes. it's um, a good prompt. Thanks, Helen. Um, I think one of the things, and this would have been in my, should have been in my list of how you can work successfully uh, um, with the sector is um, so she's talking there about um, the use of, of someone who used a lot of action songs and body movement and drama and interactions can you share tips on using these approaches so what again what I one of the tips I would say if you if you've got particular things like that that you would like to to be part of your program, sharing them in advance before children come to your, so that the, the kayako in the centre can prepare. And that not only goes for songs and things, but other things that, you know, like, so that children can get an idea of what to expect. You know, when you go to um, an art gallery, um, you know, or, or a museum, it's a place where people generally talk not too loudly, quietly, you know, or whatever, yeah. whatever it is, or maybe you want them to talk loudly, that's fine. But um, just sharing that sort of thing, but the songs and action things, yes, rather than hitting with them with it when they're already in a new environment, you know, and hitting with it then, I think, um, mm. yeah. yeah. Does that answer the question, Helen? Yeah. And there's some good comments in there from Margie and uh, Education Sanctuary Mountain as well about, um, the relationships um, and, and the visits. Thank you for taking me for my very first walk in the forest. You know, it's amazing for some of our students coming into our spaces, it may be the first time they've come in, you know, transport costs, uh, yeah. time, all of those things may affect how parents, you know, can bring their children in. And so it's, it's helping them understand this is their place as much as anyone else's and how can you uh, bring in, that's, that's an amazing, Amazing story. Now, somebody, I think you, Monica, I knew somebody had their hand up earlier. Rachel, do you still want to take the mic or we've got about six minutes left? So there is time if you want to take the mic and, and tell us what you're thinking. Um, no, I was just going to say I, we um, do a similar thing. Um, we have a kitty and we go through our centre and we pick up items like kokowai or and they feel it or obsidian and bits and pieces and um, ingredients for rock art, um, Māori rock art. So um, that, that's, yeah, that, that's quite successful. Um, and if we're going to a centre, often we'll do a small, either a small play or um, a story and then it relates to um, a hands-on activity that yeah. we do as well um, yeah within an hour yeah good example of an integrated curriculum yeah <laughs> thank you Monica 
Um, I um, had to think earlier um, when you talked about um, in when, when you talked about the way uh, kids look at the world, you know, looking at the world with their eyes, and it took me a while <laughs> to figure this out. But um, we have an a, activity when I was at Baitangi, which was uh, putting yourself on the treaty grounds, and it had an image of the flag oh there. It has spaces for the flags, and um, quite often. And sometimes you would find the kid, um, you know, a little child um, with their friends around them, they would draw themselves under the flags up and some of them drew the flags. Um, we used it for the older early childhood kids in year one, two, three kind of. But quite often there was just a crisscrossing of lines across that paper. And it took me a long time to realize what it was. <laughs> when I went down on the kids level, I could see that all those big guy ropes or wires that hold up the flag stuff are really, really prominent for them. But I hadn't realized that because, you know, my five foot three, you know, put with me at a at a higher level to them. So so those wires were not in my view. But once I came down to their level, I could see that mm. all they can see from down there is those massive big wires crossing mm. themselves. But I couldn't actually see the flags. And it was a real eye opener mm. to go back to actually looking at the world from the kids level mm. and from the kids point of view. But thanks for sharing that earlier. That reminded me of that. It's yeah. a really good point about being in one we I didn't say before about getting at the children's level. One thing I've often done with um, a Kayako in a center is um, it's probably not very good for their knees. Probably ACC wouldn't be happy, but never mind. Um, they didn't do it for very long. Um, get them to on their knees um, walk around the center and just see what children see. Um, so you could yeah perhaps the same for some of in some of your context mm. that would be a useful thing to do mm. well um i has been um, a whirlwind you know this hour is almost over <laughs> this mm. is amazing we i'm sure we could discuss this for a long time still and it makes me really feel um more strongly that i'm missing being around kids you know i'm missing um been um, sharing a space with some little children. Mm -hmm. So um, thanks for doing that and not thanks for doing that. <laughs> but I'm sure all of us have come away really inspired. So thank you so much again, Anne, for your um, time and expertise, Tara, for mm -hmm. your um, guidance and uh, helping us understand more about Tifariki. Uh, really awesome. And um, I'm sure everybody will appreciate the resources when we send them around. And the webinar, no doubt, will be watched many times again. Um, can I just say one thing? I'm really happy because I'm now kind of sort of in that um, post working um, phase of my life. I won't use that horrible word retirement. And I, I, I'm really, I, I, you know, if people want to continue a conversation or get in touch with me, I'm really happy I, I, to talk more about Tafariki or anything. Yeah, I'd be really happy to do that. And I don't, I, for nothing, you know, like I'm just, I, I love museums. I love, uh, particularly love art galleries um and uh yeah so yeah oh thank you so much in um no doubt uh, many of us will take up your very kind offer and we'll learn lots and lots from you in fact elaine has just said that this has been brilliant thank you so much she's from waikato museum mm. so thank you once again we've got a couple of minutes before we finish this call um and um embarrassingly i find myself up on the screen <laughs> um i'm going to run a webinar next week on aotearoa new zealand's histories the latest addition to um the new zealand curriculum um, the, um both for um the new zealand curriculum and for timara tanga or aotearoa um uh, new zealand histories aspect has been added to the curriculum i will be speaking about the new zealand curriculum and um, part the english medium um curriculum and um, we will basically have a look at the new curriculum content and um, how we can support teachers, uh, schools, um, community and learners, uh, first and foremost, um, to get to grips with um, this area that has um, been covered in schools to varying degrees in the past. This was a very convoluted long sentence about <laughs> this topic, but I hope uh, we see some of you next week. However, it's coming up to um, 4 30, so it's time for Karakira, Eka Karakia Fakamutunga. Ono here, ono here, ono here, Kiti Uru Tapunui, Kia Watea, Kia Mama, Te Ngako, Te Tinana, Te Waroa Ite Ara Takata, Kara Irongo, Faka Iria Ake Kirunga, Kia Tina, Na, Uye, Taiki. 
Thank you so much again, everybody who has made the time to join us here today. We'll look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Um, go well, all the best. See you soon. Hakite.